Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Joanne Berg. I'm one of the vice chairs of the Combined APSA AAP Advocacy Committee. The Advocacy Committee has over 50 members, and it is an engaged and very creative committee. I would just like to say it is a real pleasure working with that committee. We had such a large uh, group that what we did is we divided into four areas of interest uh, to work on uh, different issues that interested us. And one of those issues was food insecurity. Today I have the pleasure of introducing to you three very experienced pediatric surgeons who are all advocates and activists for food for their patients. And you will see through the presentation that these advocates are saving lifetimes. First is Dr. Marshall Stone. He's the Medical Director of Pediatric Surgery at Jupiter Medical Center in Jupiter, Florida. We have Dr. Jeffrey Gander, who is an Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Virginia Children's Hospital. And Dr. Kirk Reichert, who could not be here today due to a family graduation, but he is the Clinical Director and the Surgical Director of the Operating Room and the Bariatric Surgery Program at Nemours in Wilmington, Delaware. Of note, he is also the President Chapter for, his, uh, for the AAP. I have a few slides to put the talk in context. <clears throat> and I would also like to point out uh, that this talk, if you take a look at the APSA pillars, this talk, this talk hits on quite a few of our APSA pillars. So to start, the United States Department of Agriculture <laughs> defines food insecurity as the limited or uncertain access to enough food. It's estimated that one in seven American children may experience food insecurity, and this is considered an important adverse childhood experience which sets, which sets up children for poor outcomes later. Food insecure children are often sick, they recover slowly, they're frequently hospitalized. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a very good toolkit to explain simply how to screen for food insecurity. And uh, if you ask your patients these questions and they screen positively for food insecurity, then you can direct them to the National Hunger Hotline, which is a very good resource for them and we'll connect them with sources of food in their area. This is my most important slide. And this slide explains how food insecurity, lack of housing, lack of education, poor health, and interaction with the justice system all interact on a, con or all in continuity with each other and impact each other. If we can impact one area, we will impact other areas as Dr. Megan Rainey explained in her um, talk. Hungry children often struggle in school and don't develop properly. They are really set up for a lifetime of poor outcomes. One of our pillars is that we are engaged with the national health care agenda. And last September was the first White House conference to address hunger, nutrition, and health in over 50 years. Improving our food supply and our nutrition is part of our uh, national agenda. <laughs> Finally, I would just like to say that there are very good studies that show food insecure people in the United States incur an extra $1,800 in medical cost every year per person. This accounts for $77 billion in additional health care expenditures. An investment in food insecurity is an investment in our overall health care. And now I'm going to hand the podium over to um, Dr. Marshall Stone. All right, good morning. I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes presenting the FreshRx Farm to Patient Program and sharing with you some of our exciting results. I have no disclosures. According to, according to the USDA, Currently, 34 million people and over 9 million children are food insecure. Many of them have limited 
or no access to healthy fresh fruits and vegetables. In addition, there is a lack of nutrition education and cooking techniques, as well as guidance on physical and mental wellness. Hippocrates, in his own words, said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. This quote, though thousands of years old, acknowledges the importance of eating healthy diet and the nutrients in the various foods have healing properties. Why is this important to us? I have always believed in treating the whole patient. Over the past 10 years, I have noticed an increase in childhood obesity, diabetes, Crohn's disease, ADHD, and other mental health problems in our surgical patients. I am sure everyone here has operated on a 300-pound teenager with appendicitis or gallstones and their associated comorbidities. FreshRx Farm to Patient Program aims to address these types of patients. As pediatric surgeons, we have a unique opportunity. When we perform surgery on our patients, we are making a significant and permanent change in their health, and thus, we have a captured audience. I found that many of my patients at their post-operative visits want to make a change in their health. I often like to use the analogy of a child being struck by a car while riding his or her bicycle without wearing a helmet and sustaining a head injury. In our trauma program, after the child recovers, we send him or her home with a bicycle helmet and giving them the tools and education to prevent a future head injury. <coughs> Enrolling patients in the FreshRx program gives them access to healthy foods and vegetables, along with nutrition education, and provides them with the tools to make a change in their health. FreshRx, a nonprofit organization, aims to address food insecurity through innovation programs that promote access to healthy, fresh produce and nutrition education as a vital combination to assist participants and families in making the connection between food and wellness. The structure supporting local family-owned farms that use organic practices strives to build a sustainable, healthy community. Program participants with a variety of medical conditions are referred in by providers, nurse practitioners, hospital nutritionists, social workers, and child life specialists. Most are screened for food insecurity, sign informed consent, and complete entry, end of study, and follow-up health surveys. The participants of the program are enrolled for 16 weeks and are provided locally sourced fresh fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Every week at either pickup or delivery, they receive our educational newsletter, Fresh Fridays. The newsletter highlights the nutritional benefits of the vegetable of the week and provides recipes, cooking techniques, as well as physical and mental wellness resources. On our website, our participants can translate this newsletter into any language in the world. The participants' responses to the surveys were reviewed and analyzed. In the years 2019 to 2022, 318 of those enrolled completed the surveys. The breakdown of the patient participant types and their ages are shown. The blue bars represent entry into the program, and the yellow bars are at completion. We surveyed the participants with the questions shown, and the changes were significant. Similar changes were seen with our pediatric participants. When we surveyed the participants after completion of the program on changes in food consumption, we observed a decrease in carbohydrate and an increase in vegetable, fruit, and legume consumption. 83% of participants who enrolled completed the entire 16-week program. At three-month follow-up, 75% of participants reported that they continued to eat 
a healthy diet, remained active, and felt that their overall health had improved. In conclusion, we show that the FreshRx Farm to Patient program can positively influence diet, physical, and mental wellness. Providing nutrition education, recipes, cooking resources, and mental wellness resources may improve long-term health. I'd like to diverge for a moment and share with you our other program, FreshRx Farm to Kids. <clears throat> to date, seven gardens have been built at local schools and boys and <coughs> girls clubs. Over 600 students have been enrolled. The program provides free hands-on instruction in gardening and a STEM-inspired classroom curriculum. FreshRx has developed a toolkit that will be available for other institutions throughout the country to start similar programs. This will also be available on the advocacy website. We are developing a FreshRx patient program for low-income expecting mothers who are screen positive for food insecurity. Here is a brief outline of the key components of the Farm to Patient Toolkit. Before I conclude, I'd like to share with you one of our patient's stories. And what better way to tell his story than to hear it directly from him? Can we please play the video? I came out and give me spikes I don't like. That because it goes into my body and needs you get stronger to fight that cancer. I really wanted to go here years. Now I'm finally here. It's so amazing to see Kane now running around like this because last year he was going through his chemotherapy and his leukemia, had no hair, and uh, he's just recovered so beautifully. I was walking back, but it was really I wish I could bring you. If we can make a change in our pediatric surgeons patient's diet and health, then they will become healthy adults and healthy mothers, and perhaps reduce the number of premature births with their associated comorbidities and comortalities. And maybe we will be contributing to saving lifetimes. Thank you. At one of the plenary sessions in the 2018 AAP meeting in Orlando, there was a speaker who talked about how her doctor helped her out of, out of poverty and end her addiction to drugs by asking about and addressing her social determinants of health. I needed to learn more. And fortunately, I was able to go to the workshop at APSA in 2019 on social determinants of health. I learned a ton. And at the end, all of us were asked, how will you help your community? So let me tell you about a patient that answered the question for me. Uh, David was 16 and I was called to see him for appendicitis in the emergency department. What struck me most about him was his weight. He was well over 300 pounds. At his follow-up visit, we spoke about many things, but one thing we spoke about was, well, what do you eat in a typical day? His answer was, well, I don't know, whatever they uh, have at school lunch. Usually it's just pizza. So I started to learn more and read about school lunches. I found out that the school lunch programs are very underfunded, typically only receiving about $1 to $2 per day per student per meal. And that's not a lot to nourish our children. But school lunches are a major, major social safety net and have helped many children. That became very clear to me when the pandemic hit. In April 2020, there was a news story locally about two not-for-profits in Charlottesville teaming up to give out school lunches during spring break. I was able to volunteer and met the chair of one of the not-for-profits. She told me, you're right, school lunches aren't perfect, but they are helping millions of children with food insecurity. A lot of these kids wouldn't eat otherwise. This was the first time I learned about what food insecurity was, and I thought, well, maybe this is how I can help my community. 
In Virginia, where I practice, food insecurity rates really vary by county, with some of the highest rates being seen in the southwest area of the state. In Appomattox County and Charlottesville, where UVA Children's is, the rates are estimated to be 17% of households. They're likely higher, as a lot of this data is pre-pandemic. Hunger Free America recently looked at USDA and census data, as well as surveys of food pantries, and found a 54% increase in food insecurity in Virginia over a one-year period. So now that we know it's a problem, well, why is it important to healthcare providers? For starters, food insecurity seems to be associated with risk of cardiovascular disease. Multiple studies support this, but in particular, the USDA did a study in 2017 that showed that 36% of people with very low food insecurity at hypertension compare with 20% of people with high food security. Similarly, 14% of people with very low food insecurity had diabetes compared with 7% of people with high food insecurity. A meta-analysis investigating mental health and food insecurity showed you're 2.7 times more likely to screen positive for depression and 2.4 times more likely to screen positive for anxiety if you had food insecurity. Recently, UCLA looked at just under 300 expectant mothers and found that food insecurity had a three-fold association with a baby being born before 37 weeks. There appeared to, be, appeared to be an even higher association with being born earlier as there was over five-fold risk of a baby being born by 30, before 35 weeks if the mother experienced food insecurity. So now that we know that not having enough access to nutritious foods is important to health, well, what are the best foods for health? Fruits and vegetables are the best studied. The Healthy Plate recommendations are that 50% of your meal should be made up of fruits and vegetables. A study of nearly 500,000 people showed that for each serving of fruits and vegetables per day, your risk of death from cardiovascular disease goes down by 4%. A 14-year study of 100,000 people showed people who averaged eight or more servings per day were less likely to have a heart attack or stroke, 30% less likely to have a heart attack or stroke. While risk of cancer is mixed, there are some studies that support a higher intake of fruit seems to reduce the risk of breast cancer. Finally, another large study showed that higher intake of whole fruits, such as blueberries, grapes, and apples, reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. So it seems like we have to get our patients more fresh fruits and vegetables. If you haven't heard of this concept yet, there's something called a food desert. The USDA, however, typically refers to it as a low income and low access area. It's an area that does not have easy access to a supermarket or even a food pantry, especially for nutritious food. The USDA has data where you can map low access uh, to food and low income. So just around the corner from UVA is a neighborhood called Fifeville. This is an area that has a median income of less than $18,000, uh, has a median income of $18,000 per year and more than 100,100 100 housing units that do not have access to a car. As best as I can tell, these are the only two convenience stores in the neighborhood, and neither one sell fresh fruits or vegetables. So going back to our story, I, I've been thinking a lot about my patient with obesity, as well as a way to get more fruits and vegetables for our patients. I learned about a not-for-profit in Charlottesville called the Local Food Hub. They helped so start something called a produce prescription program named Fresh Pharmacy with an F. They partner with Farmers of Virginia to get locally grown produce to patients with obesity and diet-related diseases. I worked with our pediatric dietitians. I partnered with a uh, pediatrician, uh, as well as our social workers, to identify patients who would benefit from the program. After fundraising, for the next year and a half, we were able to support 60 pediatric patients and their families to receive bi-weekly fresh fruits and vegetables. One of our residents wanted to study our initial intervention. One question we asked was about the number of servings of fruits and vegetables per week. The number of people who are taking at least, servings, at least four servings of vegetables went from 6% to 53%. The number of households who are taking at least four servings of fruits went from 33% to 60%. So we now knew that our program increased uh, fresh, uh, excuse me, fruit and vegetable intake. In the fall of 2021, we applied for a grant through USDA's GUSNIP program to study the effectiveness of our produce prescription program on health outcomes. It got great feedback, but wasn't funded initially. Fortunately, the American Recovery Act was passed, and in it was additional funding for the USDA and its GUSNIP program. In May 2022, we found that our three-year grant was funded. 
Pediatric patients with food insecurity and their families will receive 12 months of biweekly free fruits and vegetables. Then for the subsequent 18 months, they will receive a $40 voucher to purchase produce at farmer's markets. If they want, they can receive free bags as well. We will be doing surveys and looking at heights, weights, blood pressures, and importantly, healthcare utilization, such as emergency room visits. Now, the produce was being delivered to people for patients' houses, and a requirement was to live in Charlottesville. The dietitians I was working with wanted to get more patients of ours healthy food, given that we have people that come from all over our state. We felt that an on-site food pantry of healthy, non-perishable items could meet this need. At their visit, anyone with food insecurity would meet with a social worker, make sure they had all their benefits, especially SNAP benefits, that they were eligible for, and go home with food that day. I wandered around our clinic building and found equipment in that room that wasn't really being used for anything, as you can see here. One of our patient care technicians cleared out the space. We applied for and received a grant from uh, Kroger's Foundation for food. I recruited some free help, known as my two oldest children, Ryan and Drew, and we bought shelves and put them together on a Saturday. Our dietitians made a list of food, and we put our pantry together. Here's our list. In general, it is items with low salt and low or no added sugars. We average around 50 visits per month, and this is for all the pediatrics clinics in, in the building. Mandarin oranges are our most popular item. Finally, if you want to do similar niches at your institution, look at what not-for-profits, look at the not-for-profits in town that are working in this space. Ask how you can help. Many of them would love to partner with healthcare providers. My name is Kirk Reichard from Nemours Children's Hospital in Delaware. I'm also a member of the joint APSA AAP Advocacy Committee. I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you live in person today, but our son graduates from college this morning, and I'm sure you can understand that he takes priority for us today. I have no disclosures other than that I'm a surgeon who is passionate about confronting childhood obesity. I'm also a developing surgeon advocate, and I'm hoping to recruit a few partners today. For those of us who take care of children and adolescents, this slide should come as no surprise. The proportion of children and adolescents with obesity in this country continues to rise. We see ever-increasing numbers of children with adult surgical diseases. <clears throat> we see the burden of comorbidities in our clinics and the consequences of these comorbidities and our ability to safely perform surgery for even the most routine conditions. Now, if there's a bright spot on this slide, it's the curve for the youngest children, where the prevalence seems to be flattening. More on this later. It should also come as no surprise that the COVID pandemic was no friend to these children. <clears throat> Many of you who know me know that I've spent a significant part of my career working to advance the field of metabolic and bariatric surgery in children. This landmark AAP clinical practice guideline published in pediatrics in late January creates the framework for providing comprehensive obesity care for children and adolescents from primary care offices through weight management clinics, medications, and weight loss surgery. However, today I come to you as surgeon advocate. Last month, five members of this committee traveled to Washington, D.C. to hone our skills and visit the offices of our home congressional delegations. If you've never done so, I would urge each of you to take advantage of the advocacy summit sponsored annually by the AAP and the American College of Surgeons. The didactic sessions and keynotes are informative and inspiring, and the visits to Capitol Hill are eye-opening. Pediatricians, and particularly surgeons, carry much weight with members of Congress. Our patient stories are what resonate most, and they look to us as trusted advisors. If there was anything from that week that encouraged me, it is that even in this time of profound polarization, many legislative bills that address childhood health still enjoy broad bipartisan support. So the rest of my remarks will focus on the prevention rather than the treatment of childhood obesity. There are many factors that play into this pandemic, this epidemic, and I've named a few here. This morning, we'll focus on nutrition. In particular, we'll focus on food insecurity. Many consider food security as a critical social determinant of health, along with safe and welcoming homes and neighborhoods, quality education and health care, and clean air and water. Now, recent evidence points to a clear correlation between food insecurity and obesity. 
in our own institution, amongst more than 30,000 primary care visits in 2022, children from families that reported food insecurity were nearly twice as likely to have obesity. Now, clearly correlation does not prove causation because many of the social determinants coexist, but there is no question that consistent access to nutritious foods is vital. Just so we're all on the same page, the USDA defines food security as access by all people at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Screening tools such as this one from the USDA are used by many organizations. Most focus on the first two to three questions when conducting screening and research. They primarily center around anxiety that food would run out, that purchased food did not last, or that they could not afford a balanced meal. Note, this does not imply that they are necessarily skipping meals or losing weight. In fact, most do not. Rather, food security lies along a continuum. It turns out that most at-risk families live here in the middle, where food may not be scarce, but where scarce resources force difficult decisions about purchasing nutrient-dense versus calorie-dense foods. There's hesitation to introduce new foods that their children may not eat and will be wasted. Compounding this is the fact that many of these families live in relative food deserts, where local stores do not stock nutritious foods such as fresh fruits and vegetables, lean sources of protein. These families may also lack transportation to travel to larger well-stocked supermarkets, and therefore they resort to shopping at local convenience stores and bodegas. Food insecurity is very prevalent among children and spiked during the pandemic. I think we all experienced long lines and empty shelves in 2020 and 2021, and the stores in the food deserts were particularly hard hit with worker shortages and supply chain disruptions. So what levers do we have? There are several government programs that enjoy relative bipartisan support. In particular, the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, has been supported throughout the last half century. Earlier, I alluded to a flattening of the curve in younger children, and WIC is thought to be one reason why. In children who received WIC benefits since 2010, the prevalence of obesity is actually dropping. Unfortunately, while the proportion of children who qualify for WIC have remained relatively stable, the participation rate drops off quickly after infancy. Infants and their new moms are supported by birth hospitals in the initial application, but yearly renewals drop. Opportunities for intervention include simplifying the application process and preventing providing support in primary and specialty care clinics to help families renew their eligibility. The National School Lunch Program was signed into law by Harry Truman nearly 80 years ago, and it established the first childhood nutrition program of its kind. It focuses on providing healthier foods during the school day. A recent analysis demonstrated that the healthy eating index of all children are improved, including amongst children from food insecure households. During the COVID pandemic, school districts scrambled to create novel ways to distribute these foods to children who are now learning remotely, such as grab and go programs. Now Congress is responsible for reviewing and reauthorizing programs such as WIC and the school lunch program every five years. They frequently do not. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed the Healthy Hungry for Kids into, into law. This extended funding for healthier foods to non-school hours, such as weekends, holidays, and summers, and provided for a variety of other new nutrition and healthcare initiatives. It was the first meaningful increase in nutrition support in 30 years. This was also the first program of its kind to demonstrate a decrease in weight, not just prevalence, but weight, among eligible children after implementation compared to the projected trend based on pre-implementation data. While HHFK technically expired in 2015 before it was fully even operational, the funding persists. But continued funding of these and other vital child nutrition programs will depend on reauthorization bills. One such bill that did not pass out of the House of Representatives last, su last summer this bill was called the Healthy Meals, Healthy Kids Act and deserves our attention and advocacy when it comes back up. But I wanna spend the last minute or so calling out the opportunities locally. As president of the Delaware chapter of the AAP, I've been working to build collaborative relationships with the Food Bank of Delaware. They're well supported by the community and we're working to increase their reach to families with young children 
through our membership. Of particular interest to us is the backpack program, which is distributed through the elementary schools and provides weekend and holiday meals for at-risk children to supplement HHFK. We're helping to pilot a similar program for preschool age children that can be accessed from the offices of our primary care members. In addition, age appropriate books about healthy foods are distributed that link our chapter's early literacy project. Home delivery options are a growing strategy, capitalizing on the burgeoning last mile economy that most of us and our children access using our smartphones nearly every day. Partnerships with Amazon and DoorDash connect the well-stocked <coughs> food bank warehouses and local farms with families who lack transportation. The Food Bank of Delaware provides full-time counselors that help families navigate the WIC application process so that more Delaware children participate after one year of age. The Delaware chapter of the AAP is working to connect primary care offices to this valuable resource. One final partnership that has been fruitful in the mobile pantry. We are working with the food bank to bring these vehicles to pediatric primary care offices and have started adding vaccination capability starting at the beginning of the pandemic. So I've quickly taken you through what food insecurity is, how it is related to obesity, and how we as surgeons can be advocates both nationally and locally to help improve the nutrition of children in our communities. I've also added the link to the AAP.org Food Insecurity Toolkit. Thank you for joining us, and I will turn it over to the panel who will further explore some novel programs and their outcomes. So we just have a few slides to show you um, that uh, relate to data collection in this area, and uh, then we'll open the floor for any questions. So there have been some changes in the ICD-10 codes as far as collecting data for social determinants, and this is quite new. We wanted to let the membership know that um, it is the code Z59.4 that is used for lack of adequate food and safe drinking water. This, this is how we will begin to collect data around social determinants and um, do further studies on how we can impact this. These are some of the new um, codes that are used to document social determinants, and this has uh, uh, come out from our Centers for Medicaid Services. Finally, we wanted to conclude with uh, this slide that relationships are all there is, and everything in the universe exists because it is in relationship to everything else. Nothing exists in isolation. We have to stop pretending that we are individuals that can go it alone. We're all connected. And now we'd like to entertain your questions. Hi, <clears throat> um, I'm Abigail Martin from the University of Kentucky, although I recently was one of Kirk's partners, so very familiar with the work that he is doing. And I want to congratulate all of you on the amazing work that you're doing. Um, this is more a comment than a question, but I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was, is aware um, the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition actually has a Malnutrition Awareness Week, and this year it's um, September 18th through the 22nd, and they, their website is nutritioncare.org, and you can go there, and there are a lot of different ways that they have um, listed where you can become involved and help educate your communities. Um, I, I'm hoping by my comment, I think it would be a wonderful partnership for ABSA and AAP to um, help and work in conjunction with Aspen. Um, Aspen is a, an organization that is both adult and pediatrics, but I think that, but they are very committed to pediatric nutrition, and I think it's something that this committee should um, look into. Thank you. Uh, Thank, yeah. you. Thank you for your comment. Any comments from the panel? No? It sounds, it sounds like a great, great group. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm Priyanka Chug. I'm a resident at Boston Medical Center and research fellow at Boston Children's Hospital. And um, this is all really wonderful work. We have a um, prescription for nutrition at our hospital as well. Um, something I was wondering if you could speak about with the particular programs is the um, cooking classes. Are they done in a way that's culturally competent, you know, sort of taking into account that um, a lot of people want to use healthy foods but don't know how to do that where it fits into their culture? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. We, in, in, uh, in Florida, we did run into that challenge because of the different ethnic groups and the minorities. So what we've done, <clears throat> excuse me, in our health surveys, and we've learned by asking all the questions over the four years, is what do you need, what do you, how can we help you? You're right, it depends on their background. So we, we've actually created those recipes that are very simple you don't need much to cook with. You don't need those high-tech cooking material. And we've made recipes that take five minutes. One of the things we've learned by adding grains, legumes, quinoa, brown rice, lentils, lentil pasta, which has got a lot of protein versus regular pasta, and then giving them guidance on simple recipes and teaching them how to like make one meal and it lasts three or four days in the refrigerator. So we've gone through all the different types of recipes. So every week in Fresh Fridays, we list simple recipes in the health newsletter with you know, taking that into account. And I think it's helped a lot. And one of the things I learned is asking them every week what they, what they want, what they need, really guides us how to improve making that change. Uh, say thanks for your comment. Your um, institution really is kind of at the forefront of this. I'm, Taken a lot of, uh, gotten a lot of ideas from speak from speaking to the group there. Um, we're doing something very similar for our grant. Um, we're going to be recruiting um, members, uh, community advocates, to uh, to go over recipes and, and to give feedback, you know, on uh, on how the program is. E each bag also has a handout about the food, how to cook it, uh, and we also have access to a pretty extensive video library uh, of cooking. Um, but we're going to be updating that as well for the grant. Thank you. Uh, Robin Petrozzi, University of Florida in Gainesville. I just want to congratulate you guys on a really excellent panel because I think this is one of the most impactful and inspiring panels at APSA. You know, if we can't affect patient outcomes by addressing poverty, then we're not going to make changes. So um, congratulations because it's absolutely fantastic what each of you are doing. Um, but, and, and also in doing a, a joint um, committee with AAP and APSA, you know, gives you a lot of opportunity. So how far can you push the, you know, margin? So there's, there's CPT codes for metrics of poverty and access. Um, why is that not a requirement as part of uh, CSV verification? Um, or reimbursements, you know, so we look at quality metrics and, and central line infections and why are we not looking at if hospitals have um, some assessment of social determinants of health and particularly something that we can, right, address would be things, trauma verification is moving to having to include abuse screening. So, you know, from a children's surgical verification and that, can, is there a way to push having a, a food insecurity program? Thank you so much for your question, and um, I can try to address it. Um, so ever since the um, White House conference last September, there was a mandate through the um, uh, Medicare services, Children's Medicare services and Medicaid, that the ICD-10 codes would start to include um, the social determinants of health. And um, as part of our learning objectives, that was why I showed the slide with the code for food insecurity. Um, so there, are, it's just starting, it's quite new that these, through our ICD-10 codes, we will actually be able to collect data and we encourage everyone to actually use those codes. They are available if you have uh, EPIC as your EMR. Um, one issue right now is that there's only one program and one area where you can actually bill extra if you are coding, but we would still encourage everyone to learn them. It's part of the table that I showed and to utilize them. And it's really just through, um, you know, through data collection and then looking at outcomes and doing outcome studies that we will be able to um, have any, you know, further impact in these areas as far as advocates, um, because advocacy, it, it, stories are very important, but data is also important as well. And um, as we um, see, 
um, the links between social determinants and not having gardens, having food deserts and violence, we learn that all these things are, are really truly interconnected. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate your question. Do you, just as a follow-up, do you know if anyone, you know, similar to some of the child abuse screening BPAs that fire that have to get nurse screening and, and that sort of thing, if anyone's developed that for the new codes and for food insecurity? I don't think anything is automatic. I don't think anything is very well integrated yet. And um, all of this, we're really just on the forefront. And these are things that we discuss in our committee is, um, you know, what is our next step? What are we going to do next? What are, where do we need to go with all of these issues? And um, so we're, I'm making notes of your question and um, th this will be some of our next steps is how do we integrate this information into overall health record outcomes research um, so that we can, ho we hope to make a, more of an impact in certain, you know, in these areas, especially noting that gun violence is the number one killer of children in our country and yet we saw from Dr. Rani that areas that have violence, if gardens are planted, the incidence of violence goes down. Mm -hmm. So um, just uh, it's important that we understand all the interconnectedness of all these issues and that we, we appreciate it, we study it, we use all of our great scientist skills and our, our writing skills, our communication skills. I have great optimism that as an organization we can make a really positive impact. Yeah. Hi, Adam Alder from Dallas. I think it's clear based on the presentations that funding and legislation is a big driver behind some of the programs that are true safety net and have had an impact on things like food insecurity and things. And I saw recently on a social media site for a congressman that's in my state who is looking to place restrictions on the types of food that could be bought, meaning no sugar, those types. What's the group's opinion about those restrictions? Does that keep people from participating in those programs? Does that lead to kind of the diversion tactics like we see in the opioids? I mean. What, is that a positive thing for someone to think about in terms of legislation, or are there better ways to get people in terms of education other things to buy the right food? Yeah, it's a good question. <clears throat> I think it potentially is a positive thing. I know, for example, WIC, um, Dr. Reichardt had talked about in his video, uh, juice is, is, in, is a, um, you're allowed to buy a certain amount of juice per, per month. And it's a great question whether that really is, is beneficial. Is there any really health benefits of juice? So, so I think it probably is. Um, it, you know, if, if that money comes out for, let's say, juice goes up for fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, I think that's reasonable. Um, but if it puts other restrictions on it, you know, it's something that we'd have to address, I think. Marshall, any, any comments on that? No? Okay. Is there time? Anil. Um, my question is, is, particularly for those of us who are um, advocacy, advocacy neophytes, um, you know, we're surgeons, we have a finite amount of time and resources, and you've provided a lot of great different programs, but how do we decide, you know, what is potentially the best intervention for our community? You know, should it be something that's like hospital-based versus community-based versus like legislative, um, something that can be done on a legislative level? Uh, think, and particularly with regards to um, this, this uh, very salient issue. Thank you. Yes. I, would say, I think it's okay to start small, like start at your mm -hmm. clinic. You know, if you want to um, screen all your patients for food insecurity, you know, have your check-in folks do it or you do it or nurses or whoever it is, whoever it is and, and then make sure that all those people are getting access to the benefits they're um, eligible for, SNAP benefits, WIC benefits, like we mentioned. Uh, and that's kind of how we started. And then we've slowly grown, and right now I'm trying to get um, – every hospitalized patient uh, to be screened for food insecurity, that they can go home with either food or, or making sure they have their benefits. So, you know, it, it does feel daunting, but I, th I think just starting small at, you know, just maybe your, your clinic or, um, you know, your partner's clinics. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I was going to add that, um, that I think the toolkit that we're going to um, provide will help 
Um, it, it is a challenge for any institution to set up a food pharmacy or a fresh RX program. And, you know, it really starts, I learned in the, my four years with a uh, physician champion, whether it's me or a pediatrician or one of us as a surgeon, obviously being a pediatric surgeon, I can't be involved in doing this all the time. So we work on recruiting all the key components and you really have to get administration to buy in, the, uh, all the providers, nutritionists. It, there are challenges with fundraising, et cetera, but we found, like uh, Jeff said, we started small and you know we're, we have 500 families and patients in four years in uh, the Fresh RX patient program and we enroll about 140 a year. And I think as just starting small and getting the support from your community and working with your community farmers is a, is a way to start. And I'd be happy to you know, give advice at another time and just how to set up a program. Well, thank you so much for your attention and um, thank you for the great questions.